Well, this month, it's a really different month. This is the, well, the second time I've preached. I preached the, the Christmas Eve service. But uh, the first time I preached on a Sunday morning all December. I can't tell you how many years it's been since that's happened. But I'm thankful for our, uh, for, for Pastor Mark Agner and for Pastor Mark Harris and Pastor Josh Kerbway. Um, so capable in rightly dividing the word of truth. Um, and it's been good. I hope that you have enjoyed. I know I've heard some of you say how you've enjoyed hearing somebody besides me all the time. And that is quite all right. I, you know, we, everyone um, responds differently to different people and their style and, and their illustrations. And, and it's the same word, the same truth that we need to hear. And it's just good to hear other people proclaiming it. And so I'm thankful for them. But I'm also thankful to be back uh, in the pulpit to preach this morning and bring the word to you. And so uh, we are looking at uh, the, the birth of Jesus Christ through different eyes. We, we've seen the shepherds and, and uh, Herod. And, and so this morning, we're looking at the birth of Jesus Christ through the eyes of Simeon. Simeon, one of my favorite characters. And uh, on Christmas Eve, if you were with us, we looked at the one we seek, Jesus Christ. And we used this very same text, Luke chapter 2, verses 25 to 35. Those 10 verses that are about Simeon. And we looked at what Simeon said about Jesus, the one we seek. Well, this morning, we're looking at the same passage of Scripture, so you, you will be familiar with it already. But instead of looking at the one we seek, we're looking at the one who seeks, the Jesus seeker. What is it that, that Simeon shows us about the one who seeks Jesus? What will we look like? And so we're going to look at a portrait of a Jesus seeker this morning. I mean, if I were to ask you to describe, say, an archaeologist, one who seeks buried treasure, how would you describe them? You know, what, would you, what, what comes to mind? Is it, is it someone who wears a lot of khaki, right? Or someone who wears shorts with lots of pockets or the, the, the little vest with all the pockets in them and little picks and brushes and, and uh, maybe a, a, a broad-brimmed hat to keep the sun off as they're excav excavating. Excavating? Excavate. Excavating, yes. All right. And so um, if that, maybe, maybe leather boots or whatever it is that you're, that you're having in mind. Maybe, maybe, maybe it's something like one of these people. You've got the, the, the guy with the, the, the large hat or maybe the fedora. Uh, I don't know that a whip that, that he has in his hand is always what uh, an archaeologist might uh, have in his hand. But, but certainly these are things that might come to mind. All right? But let me ask you this. How would you describe a Jesus seeker? What comes to mind? If I were to say, tell me about a Jesus seeker. Draw a picture. Paint a picture of a Jesus seeker. What would you certainly include? And so that's what we're going to be looking at this morning based on the portrait of Simeon. And what we're going to see... Um, this morning, as we work through this, there are things in my notes that I'm, I'm not going to, to, to say, but I'll, I'll allude to them. And then if you want to see them, you can certainly ask me, and I'll, I'll shoot you an email of my notes, and you can have the full thing. But there are, don't, no, no, don't, don't dismay, there are seven things I see in this text, right? All right? And, and, and some of them we'll just briefly allude to. But there are seven things I didn't want just to skip completely. So at this point, I want to say, here are seven things that Simeon shows us should be included in the portrait of anyone who is seeking Jesus Christ. The first one is that they can just be an average Joe. It's not some special person. In fact, uh, they may be very unimpressive. But, but, but an unimpressive person in the world's eye can be a seeker of Jesus Christ. Second, they will be righteous and devout. Third, they will be someone who is waiting on God's salvation. Waiting on God's salvation. Living for it. Number four, they will be someone who is spirit-led. 
Number five, they will be someone who blesses God in worship and blesses others. And number six, they will um, live as servants of one master. And then finally, they will face death in peace. All right? Now, even that list, you're like, wow, seven things. That's a lot. I would imagine if we really were to, to sit down in a small group and dig into this text, even this list is not exhaustive of the things we would see in Simeon. But these are what we will look at today. So let's read the passage of Scripture, Luke chapter 2. I hope you have your Bibles with you because it is the Word of God that is authoritative. And Luke chapter 2, verses 25 and we're going to, we're going to stop uh, at 32 this morning. 25 to 32. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ, or the Lord's Messiah. And he came into the spirit, into the, in the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he, Simeon, took him, Jesus, up into his arms, and he blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for the revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. Now, I'm going to keep reading. Context is good. And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the rise and the and the fall, and the, sorry, for, for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign that is opposed, and a sword will pierce through your own soul, so that thoughts from many hearts will be revealed. And I love when you read scripture, and you just read it again, and you read it again. God opens your eyes. Just then when I was reading, something hit me I hadn't seen before. He says, it's, it's my eyes have seen your salvation. You know how often we say my salvation? It's my, I'm saved. It's my salvation. But if we go back and we look at, at David, the psalmist, restore to me the joy of what? Your salvation. Salvation comes from the Lord. All right, that was extra. That was a bonus. It was free. There you go. All right. Well, let's pray and let's dig into the word this morning. Father God, thank you for your word. Thank you for Jesus Christ, whom we celebrate at this time of year, especially Father, what an amazing thing that you, in, in the second person of the Trinity, the Son, left the splendor and glory of heaven and came to take on full humanity as a little baby, fragile, frail, needy, to grow and live a sinless life to die in our place as the perfect substitute, the Lamb of God, and to rise again, defeating death, that we might defeat death in Christ and live in your glory forever. Father, how amazing that is. And even as we, we hear the cries of a baby, Lord, those, Lord, that's how Jesus cried when he was little. Lord, we thank you thank you for Jesus. Open our eyes to the truth of your word, to the wonderful things in your word this morning. Speak to our hearts, apply it, sink it deeply so that there is life change into the image of Christ, into the, 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 the full stature of Jesus Christ. Lord, that is our desire, our hope. That is what we need this morning, is to be more and more like Jesus. It's in his blessed name we pray. Amen. So first, point number one, um, those who are seeking Jesus can be really regular folks. 
I think sometimes we, put, we make this hierarchy of, of Christianity where you've got those super Christians. Those super Christians are the ones that can do X, Y, and Z, but then you've got just your regular folks, and, and they don't do X, Y, and Z. They just come to church, attend regularly, and, and you know, do their thing. And Listen, those who are truly seeking Jesus, which is the most amazing thing, that is what Christians are called to do is to follow Him. They're just regular folks. What does Luke say about, about Simeon? All he says, he was a man. There was this man. There was a man, and we know, so we know his gender, right? Okay, that's clear. We know he's a guy. That's good. That's helpful. We know where he's from. Actually, we don't even know where he's from. We know where he is. He's in Jerusalem. The same time that they brought baby Jesus to Jerusalem to fulfill the law, this guy, Simeon, he may be from wherever, but we know he is in Jerusalem. So we've got, he's a guy, he's in Jerusalem, and we happen to know his name, Simeon. All right? That is all Luke tells us. So, so I want you to notice what is not said about Simeon that would most likely have been said had it been true. Luke does not say that he was Simeon the high priest, or Simeon the elder, or Simeon the wise, or Simeon the great, or Simeon the diplomat, or Simeon the governor. I mean, it's nobody special. He was just Simeon. He was just a man, just a, a, a guy. Well, here's the good news for you and for me. We don't have to be anybody impressive to follow Jesus to be a seeker after Jesus Christ. In fact, um, I think Jesus, he he prefers to call the lowly. Um, uh, the, the The challenge is that the world pressures us to be a somebody. The world pressures us to be known for something. Um, It measures us by what they see on the outside, by our accomplishments. And now look, what we do, I want to do to my best. I want to glorify God in what I do. But look, I've got all kinds of weaknesses. I've got all kinds of of things that I don't do well. Matter of fact, I've learned that I'm I'm a three-time guy. It's never right the first time. It may be closer the second. And it may be tolerable the third, all right? But, But look, that's okay. Despite what the world says, God uses little people, unimpressive people. Uh, Charles Wesley has a quote that I love. It is a countercultural quote. It is a prayer. And here's the quote. He says, Lord, keep us little and unknown, loved and, and cherished by you alone. That, that is so counter culture. We're praying, Lord, make me impressive. Lord, make me successful. No. Charles Wesley was right. Lord, keep us little and unknown, prized and loved by God alone. So God seems to use, to prefer to use people who are unimpressive. You say, where do you see that? Well, One place is 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 24, where Paul says to the church in Corinth, who at that time, their main struggle was wanting pastors who were somebodies. They didn't like Paul because Paul didn't claim to be a somebody. He claimed to know nothing except Christ crucified. They liked the guys who were eloquent. They liked the guys who were the philosophers, you know, the the guys who, who, who claimed to know something, to be impressive. And in that context, Paul says, consider your calling, church. Consider when when God called you to trust in Jesus. Think about it. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. So it seems that God chooses whom the world esteems to be ignorant, weak, and lowly. And he chooses to give them true wisdom, divine power, 
and a royal standing. Children of the king by adoption. Simeon was an average guy in Jerusalem about whom Luke had said nothing notable to distinguish him. So what made him notable? Well, it's simply he was, he was a passionate seeker of Jesus Christ. It's simply what he said about Jesus Christ. You see, seekers of Jesus are increasingly content with their own inability. I don't know about you, but sometimes in my inabilities, I am, I am increasingly discontent. I, I'm frustrated by things I can't do. But when you're seeking Jesus, they're increasingly content with their inabilities as they, as they increasingly see Jesus to be sufficient. Where they are weak, he is strong. Seekers of Jesus are increasingly content with not knowing it all as they increasingly come to know Jesus' wisdom. They're increasingly content with their own weakness as they increasingly understand and experience the power of Jesus Christ in their lives. They're increasingly uh, con content with their own lack of control. Does that one get you? I just want to be in control of my life. I want to control how it turns out. I want to call the shots. You see, seekers of Jesus are increasingly content with their lack of control. I don't have to control everything. Why? Because I am increasingly aware of God's sovereign control over the details of my life, that He is working it out for good. Seekers of Jesus are increasingly content with their own, get this one, insignificance my own insignificance why because I simply want Jesus to be honored it, it's, it's the, the John the Baptist mentality that Jesus might increase that I, and I might decrease I may have swapped those he, that I might decrease that he might increase and we're content that I might be a nobody as long as Jesus is shown to be a somebody the ultimate somebody. We're increasingly content with our own obscurity if Jesus just might be known. If this does not describe us, this increasing contentment in these areas, it is likely, church, that we are seeking something other than Jesus first and foremost. I'm not saying that you're running away from him or that I'm running away from, but I'm saying there are other things that we're seeking before we are seeking Him, more than we're seeking Him. What notable thing can others say about you? What notable thing? And we've got gifted people in this body and, and things that I could mention about each one of you that I'm so thankful for. But listen, those things that I'm thankful for are things that the Lord has given you, right? And so the thing that we need to be, the notable thing about us needs to be that we are seeking Jesus Christ. That's the notable thing. But there's a second characteristic of Jesus seekers that Simeon shows to us. He, they are righteous and devout. And we're going to take those two things together in a sense. This is verse 25. It says he was a righteous and devout man. Well, what do these mean? Well, the word righteous used there is the Greek word dikaios. And it has a broad semantic field of meaning. And, and so we need to look at it. And what I did, I looked at the New Testament specifically. I wanted to look at those New Testament books that were of the same uh, type of literature. So I looked at the Gospels primarily. And, and specifically, I looked at Luke, a little in Matthew, but, but, some, but mostly in Luke. Because I wanted to see how Luke uses this word and, and how the, the gospel narratives use this word righteous. What does it mean when, when it says he was righteous? Well, what I saw, and let me just give you a, a, a quick rundown, a, a quick biblical theology of the word righteous, the idea, the concept of righteous in the gospels. First, being righteous is something that is determined by God in the gospels. When it says someone is righteous, 
It is, it is something that God has determined to be. Uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth, parents of John the Baptist, it says they were righteous in God's sight. God had determined that they were righteous. Uh, and, and, and so what we see also in the Gospels is that that righteous standing, it, it is not determined by others. We live for that. We want others to think we're righteous. But when the, the Gospels talk about being righteous, it is not something that is determined by other people. In fact, Matthew 23, 38, uh, 23, 28, I apologize, 23, 28, speaking of the Pharisees, Jesus says, you appeared righteous to others. But in that context, Jesus' implication is, but you're not righteous. In fact, he says, inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. You appear righteous to others. That's not what being righteous means in the Gospels. It also um, means that it's not something that we determine about ourselves. I mean, I might think I'm righteous. That does not make me righteous. Um, and so, as we look, it, it is something determined by God. Second, the righteous are declared as such by God. Not only is it determined by God, but it is something He declares to be true about us. It is not something we earn. All right? So the first one, it's by God, not us. This one is, it is declared, not merited, not earned. Okay? Romans 3.26, Paul says... The, the, declare righteous the one who has faith in Jesus. God declares righteous the one who has faith in Jesus. And that happens either by that individual looking back to Christ as the Messiah in faith, or it happens, as in the Old Testament, a person looking forward to the coming Messiah in faith. And it's, so it just depends on whether they're looking back or looking forward, but it is by grace, through faith, looking at Christ as the Savior, trusting Him to be one's Savior. In fact, uh, that looking forward to Jesus is, is expressed in Matthew 13, 17, where it says, Many prophets and righteous people, there it is, the righteous people, longed to see what you see. They longed to see it in the Old Testament. Their faith was forward-looking. The Messiah is coming. And so they were righteous. They were declared righteous. God determined them to be righteous because of their faith, their forward-looking faith. So that's the second thing. The third thing about right, being righteous in the Gospels is that it describes a relational standing, not just behaviors. That's important. The word righteous is not typically used just to mean somebody did something good. It, it, it's used to describe a relational standing with God. So it's not just you behaved well. It is God saying to us, we're good. You are in good standing with me. Whereas my wrath had been upon you because of your faith in Christ and he bore that wrath completely, now you and I, we're good. You can come before me and not fear condemnation. We are in right standing. Now, we say this because in the Gospels, we, we see there are those who are deceptively righteous. Luke 20.20 20 speaks of spies who, quote, pretended to be righteous in order to catch Jesus, right? They pretended to be righteous. They, they behaved in a way that looked righteous, but they were not righteous. They were wicked and evil. We also see that there are those who are superficially righteous. Matthew 23, 28. On the outside, you seem righteous. On the outside. But in reality, you are not righteous. Righteous describes our relationship with God, not just how we live. A fourth thing about righteous in the New Testament. The righteous do works of righteousness. So those who are righteous do works of righteousness. And this actually incorporates the second word that describes Simeon, devout. Devout is a word that speaks about piety, doing holy works. So because 
Simeon was righteous, determined as righteous by God, not by others, not by himself. He was determined by God, not because he did certain works, but because his faith was forward-looking in the Messiah. It was a relational standing he had with God. But that relational standing, that he, the fact he was right with God, it bore fruit of works. For example... Right, the righteous love well. So that when we see in Matthew 25, 37, it says that uh, you, know, ha, ha, you cared for the least of these, right? You cared for, when you cared for the least of these, you, you cared for me, Christ said. So, so when it says that, that the righteous care for the least of these, that's a work that comes up along because they're righteous. It's not a righteous standing that comes because they do works. Do you, do you see the distinction? Order matters. Joseph, father, the, 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 the stepfather of Jesus, he, it says he was righteous in Matthew 1.19. Why? Not wanting to disgrace Mary publicly. He loved well. Did his loving well make him righteous? No. It was his righteousness that produced the fruit of loving well. All right. Um, well, let's go on. So let, let's, let's, uh, let, let's summarize. To be righteous then is to be in right standing with God, not just have righteous behavior. To be righteous is what God says about us, not what others say or not what we say about ourselves. Uh, to be righteous is to be declared so by God through faith, not by keeping some standard of law because we know that no one will be declared righteous by the keeping of the law because no one keeps it perfectly. And we would have to keep it perfectly if we were to be declared righteous by the law. And then finally, to be righteous, it will produce the fruit of love and obedience and good works. It will. If you and I are righteous in God's eyes, it will bear fruit. Let me ask you this morning, does that describe you? That portrait of a seeker of Jesus, does that describe you? Are you right with God? Are you right with God because, not of your works, but because you're trusting the sacrifice of Christ to make you right with God? And does your righteousness before God produce good works? You see, the righteous and devout seek Jesus. Psalm 51, 1 says this, you who pursue righteousness, you who seek the Lord. Remember, uh, in, in the Psalms, there is parallelism. It's, it's a style, it's a, it's a poetic style where they repeat something, that two, two phrases that say the same thing in different ways. So by setting those things together, the psalmist is equating them. And it's you who pursue righteousness, you who seek the Lord. The righteous and devout long to see him. It's what they do. Number three, they wait for God's salvation. Still verse 25. It is a participle. He was waiting for. He was longing. He was looking forward to the consolation of Israel, the comfort of Israel, and to the Lord's Messiah. Waiting for something specific. Waiting is a participle there, which in indicates this was the way of life for him. This was what his life was about. It wasn't something he did once or twice. He constantly was waiting for the Savior, for the comfort that only the Savior would bring. Now, Joseph of Arimathea, uh, Luke 23, 51, it says the same thing of him. He was looking for the kingdom of God. He was a righteous man, it says, and he was looking for for the kingdom of God. It's the same word that's used of Simeon when, when it's translated waiting. Looking for, waiting, anticipating, living for. Now, let, let's be real. Waiting is hard. Nobody likes to wait, right? Uh, delayed gratification is, is a developed skill because it's, it's, it's not having what we want to have, what we expect to have. And it's difficult. Waiting uh, for Christmas as a child always hard, right? Waiting in traffic to get home, just sitting there. Waiting on hold to get something fixed or get your, 
your, your internet turned back on or you know, you're, ugh, just waiting and waiting, waiting to see the doctor. Frustrating. No one likes it. Yet to seek Jesus involves waiting. We see in a mirror dimly now, but then when Christ comes, we will see face to face. That's 1 Corinthians 13. Our suffering now doesn't compare to the glory that's going to come then. Romans 8. The kingdom dynamic is an already not yet dynamic. There is so much in Christ that we already have, we already experience. We have the Spirit of God. We have perfect forgiveness. It's incredible. But listen, that is the tip of the iceberg. There is so much more to come. Ephesians 2, 7 says that He has saved us so that, quote, in the coming ages, He might show the immeasurable riches of His grace in kindness toward us in Christ. Immeasurable riches are coming. And so, we wait. We wait. We are not what we will be. We are not sanctified fully yet. And so, we wait for that day. Now, there are two kinds of waiting. One is waiting for some uncertain outcome. Like when you go to the doctor or when you're trying to call somebody on the phone, like a, a, a customer service person to get help. You don't know how that's going to go. They may be like, sorry, can't help you. So when you're waiting for that, there's this anxiety that comes along with it because you don't know how it's going to go. But there's a second kind of waiting. This is the kind of waiting where you know the outcome. When I was standing in line at Disney, I'm like, I know what's coming. Now, it's fairly certain I'll get there. Now, they may stop the line now and again, but it's coming. And, and what's coming is going to be cool. And so we're willing to wait. I mean, come on. A, 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 a vacation where you intentionally go somewhere so you can wait. Right? Hours and hours of waiting. And why do you do it? Because you know it's worth the wait. Or you hope it is. You're pretty confident. Well, listen. Listen. Jesus Christ is coming. Salvation will be full. Our joy will be made complete. It's going to be amazing. And so we are willing to wait because we know what's coming is worth the wait. And so that we, like, like Simeon, we're waiting for salvation. Number, number four. People who seek Jesus are spirit-led. This is verses 25 through 27. Let me quickly read, read those verses again. Verse 25 has the phrase, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. Verse 26 says, and it had been revealed to him, to Simeon, by the Holy Spirit, that he wouldn't see death before he saw the Lord's Christ. And then verse 27 says, and he came in the Spirit into the temple. Three very clear and distinct expressions about Simeon's relationship with the Spirit of God. And what are those? Three different realities. Here they are. Those who seek Jesus have the Holy Spirit. They have a personal, the, the personal presence of the Spirit. The enabling of the Spirit. In the Old Testament, when people had the Spirit upon them, it was to accomplish a specific task. Uh, it often was used in reference to building of the temple. The Spirit would come upon somebody and they would be, have the ability to, to make do the fine craftsmanship. But whatever it was, it was the Spirit's enabling. And here, there is this personal presence. Now, I'm not going to get into the difference between how the Spirit came, present, uh, came presently for people in the Old Testament as distinct from the New. There is a difference, right? The main difference is the, the permanence after Pentecost and the, the, the potential for losing the Spirit's presence like King Saul did, right? But So what we know, we have even better than, than Simeon because the Spirit is not just upon us. The Spirit is within us permanently. Our guarantee that we will be resurrected. It, he is the vouch safe, the earnest down payment that we know we're going to get what we're waiting for. 
And so Simeon had the Spirit. And so do we. What an amazing thing to have the Comforter, to have the Spirit to sanctify us, to lead us into all truth, to exalt Christ before us. We are never alone. But it's not just having the Spirit present. Look at, look at Simeon. He heard the Spirit. The Spirit, it says in verse 26, revealed to him he wouldn't die. He's, the Spirit spoke to him, and he had ears to hear. Now, now listen, it doesn't say how the Spirit spoke to him. It doesn't say that he, you know, whether it was he heard this, this voice or, or whether it was an impression. It doesn't say. And you know what, what that tells me? That's not the main point. What's the main point? Simeon, a seeker of Jesus, had ears to hear the Spirit. He had ears to hear. And, and the Spirit still speaks today. And I would encourage you, rather than going out and seeking to hear a voice, that you dive into the Word of God, which was inspired. Uh, 2 Peter 1.21 says that, that we have the, the prophetic Word, as men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. The Spirit breathed these very words. You want to hear the Spirit? Read this. Once you've exhausted hearing the Spirit here, then you can listen outside of here. Now, I'm not saying, I think the Spirit speaks, and, and, and I'm, I'm thankful for that. I think He gives impressions. I think He leads. I think He directs. But I think this is, is primary. When he does do that more subjective speaking, it is always in line with this, but, it, but he speaks primarily through this, okay? And so we need to be in the Word. John 17, 17, Jesus prays for his disciples and says, sanctify them by the truth. Your Word is the truth. And in 2 Corinthians 3.18, it says that the Spirit will glorify Christ, we will see the glorified Christ, and we will be transformed into His image from glory to glory, little by little. And it says, this is by the Spirit. The Spirit is the transforming, sanctifying power in our lives as he exalts Christ in his word before our eyes, and the, the more glorious we see Christ, listen, the more holy we're going to live. So Simeon had the Spirit. Simeon heard the Spirit. Um, I will say by, in passing, when he didn't just hear it, he shared what he heard. He exhorted others to hear. Later down in, I, I think it's verse 34. Let's see. Let's look at it. Um, where he says to Mary, yeah, 34. He says to Mary and Joseph, behold. You know what that means? Listen up. So he had ears to hear, and he exhorted other people to have ears to hear the word of God from the Spirit. I hope that, that you will do both. I hope you will have ears to hear, but you will all not stop there. I hope you will exhort others to behold Christ, to have ears to to hear him. Uh, the one who has the Spirit will seek Jesus. The one who hears the Spirit will seek Jesus. But I want you to notice one thing, one last thing it says about him in verse 27. It says, And he came in the Spirit to the temple. In other words, Simeon, he had the Spirit, he heard the Spirit, and he obeyed the Spirit. When he came into the temple that day, it was, he was walking with the Spirit. Paul uses that language. If you walk by the Spirit, you'll not fulfill the desires of the flesh. Simeon was a seeker of God, and he didn't just have and hear, he heeded, right? He, he followed, he walked by the Spirit. Let me ask you this morning, does that describe you and me? Do we... As a believer in Jesus Christ, I can tell you, if you are trusting Christ to be your righteousness, you have the Spirit. He indwells you permanently. Do you have ears to hear Him? Do you give Him opportunity to speak through His Word? And do you heed what you hear from the Spirit? That is someone who seeks Christ. Fifth, here's what I'm going to do. These are very short, these last few, and I'm going to, 
I'm going to briefly summarize them and let you dig deeper. And if you want to have my notes, I will email them to you gladly. But I don't want you to miss them. Someone who seeks Jesus, number five, blesses God and others, verse 28 and 34. I want you to notice this. This is great. He took him up in his arms. He grabs Jesus. And you, you got to do that with a little baby, right? You see, oh, i got to hold that little baby. But he takes Jesus up in his arms, and he blessed God, saying. He blessed him outward. He spoke well. How did he do so? He spoke well about God's word, that God's word is reliable, and that God's salvation has been made known before all people. He blessed God. He worshiped. Seekers of Jesus will live lives of worship. We will bless God with our mouths and with our actions, with our thoughts, but not just God. Look at what it says in verse 34. And Simeon blessed them. Who? Mary and Joseph. So he blesses God, he worships God, and he bless, He is a blessing to Mary and Joseph. Joseph. You see, when we are, live lives of worship, we will be a blessing to one another. Does this describe us? As we seek Jesus, does it lead us to declare his excellencies? And does it overflow so that others around us can't help but see how amazing he is and are blessed by it? Well, let's jump on number six. Those who seek Jesus live for one master. Ver, uh, verse 29, uh, very quickly here, it starts with, Lord, now you're letting your servant depart in peace. Those words are not accidental. That word Lord, by the way, is not the normal Greek word for Lord. It's not kurios. It's the word uh, that we get despot from, and it means master, the one who calls the shots. Simeon was saying, master, master. The one who calls the shots in my life. The one who has set my death day. I am your servant. He served none other. And so the one who is seeking Jesus trusts Jesus as the master. This is a thing we constantly fight against. Because we so want to be in control. But, but the one who seeks Christ will live to serve Jesus. His master. And then finally, number seven, you thought we wouldn't get there. God, miracles do happen. The one who seeks Jesus is at peace with death. Is at peace with death. Verse 29. Now, this, and, 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 and this, as I read this, you might be going, the, the word order is, is, is odd, but this is the word order of the original Greek sentence. Now departs your servant, master, according to your word, in peace. I think Luke ordered the sentence that way. Greek is, is a flexible language syntactically, meaning the order of the, those words in the sentence. And the order then emphasizes things. Often the first or the last word is an emphasis in the Greek. And so you have it beginning with the word now. That is so, he says, at this point, now that I've seen the Savior, the Messiah, the one who comforts my heart, the one who will fix all that ails me. Now, I'm ready for death. And it's not just a readiness. It is, there is a peace because the sentence ends with the words in peace. Now, I am at peace. I, I'm ready to come. I have a peace about death. Why? Because I am righteous. Because, I'm, because I've done good works? No, no. But God has determined to declare me righteous based on His grace according to my faith in His Messiah that He did what was necessary for me to die in peace. What a, what a gift. What a comfort. At funerals, there is no comfort like it. When I do a funeral for a lost individual, an unbeliever, there is not much comfort I can give. I can love the family. I can proclaim the gospel to them. And I can tell them that you still have an opportunity to know the comfort that seeking Christ gives. That comfort of facing death in peace. 
If you don't have that comfort, if you don't know that peace today, don't walk out of this building without talking to me or Pastor Josh or Pastor Mark or some believer here that will, that will be, just say, look, let me tell you about how I came to Christ, how I trusted him to make me righteous. Don't leave here today without that. And what an amazing time of year to, to trust Jesus Christ, to, to make you righteous before God and give you that comfort. Today is the day of salvation. I, my prayer for us as a church is that increasingly we will resemble this portrait. This will be, you know, what is memorial like? It's like Simeon. It's like Simeon. A seeker of Jesus. Just seeking to know him. Reflect him. Love him. Bless him. Bless each other. Love each other. What a sweet thing. Will you pray with me? Father, I thank you for your body. I thank you for each person here. They may feel unimpressive in the world's eyes. Father, in your eyes, you're ready to do something quite impressive in them and through them. Persuade their hearts of it. Lord, I, I, I thank you for making us righteous by the merits of Christ. Lord, it gives us such comfort, such peace in every circumstance, even death. It has no sting anymore. It simply means we get to be with Jesus. We get to be fully sanctified. We get to be, uh, have our joy made full. Father, what glory that is. May we live on this earth waiting, longing for, anticipating that day. Father, if there is someone here this morning that doesn't know you, that is not righteous in your eyes because they've been trying to, to accumulate their own righteousness by works. Father, may this be the morning that they come to you humble and knowing that they need Jesus, whom we worship. Father, continue to transform us from glory to glory as a church that the world will see there is something different about us, and it is Jesus Christ. May he be the reason for this season. May he be in our celebrations. May he not be left out of his own birthday party. Father, grow us evermore to the image of Christ. We praise you, and we thank you for doing it in us, what we could never, ever do. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.